Okay, so as we uh, take a look at Ephesians and we, we begin to get into the text, um, I just remind you of this, this general idea that Ephesians 3 brings up that I think is, is, uh, gets to the goal of uh, Paul in this letter, that we would have a, a real understanding of the, the depth of God's love for us. And uh, Ephesians chapter 1, where we're at, after you get through the, the introductory greetings, uh, where Paul identifies himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, um, identifies he's writing to the saints at Ephesus, so uh, the Ephesian church there, a mix of both Jew and Gentile over there in Asia Minor, and, uh, and then says, grace and peace from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. After that introductory comment, you end up in verse 3 through 14, which is just one giant thought. Some translations simply make it one giant sentence. Uh, there's no periods at all, depending on your translation. Um, and, and that is on purpose, uh, because it's hard to break this section up into sentences. It's, it is one overriding thought, all built together. Um, you can see some of the color coding I have there to identify the Father and the times He is mentioned and the Son and the times He is mentioned and the Holy Spirit and the times He is mentioned. Um, one way you could simply think of this is you have the Father who purposed and planned uh, for our salvation, for the sending of His Son. Uh, Paul's going to identify in this section that all the blessings are inside the Son. So you have the planning of the Father. You have the Son as the, the one that redeems us. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us promises and guarantees in, in sealing us. And then last, but uh, central to the whole thing, of course, as he writes to the Ephesians, is we're the recipients of all that. We're the recipients of the planning. We're the recipients of the promises. And we're the recipients of the blessings. And uh, so as you look at that text uh, and we begin to go through it, uh, uh, one word that shows up over and over and over again is blessed. Uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Uh, there is a, a theme throughout Ephesians of blessings. And if you were to describe and try and explain to somebody what is a blessing, and that's a word that we use, it kind of has a religious connotation to it. Um, so we don't typically use it in our normal non-spiritually focused conversations, um, but it is a normal word. How would you describe to somebody what a blessing is? How would you define that? Yes, Gwen. A gift from God. Okay, so a, a, a gift in the sense of it's something that... Uh, I don't deserve it. That's right. So you have something given to you you don't deserve and yet has improved the quality of your life. That's what Ephesians is getting at, is that the quality of our life has been improved and it's not by accident. So as we talked about last week, this, there's an intentionality to God's love. Um, it is, it's not him just kind of randomly... Uh, on a whim, feeling like, oh, today I'd like to do good for somebody, and then doing that, but then tomorrow he might be in a bad mood. The Greek gods were that way. Um, if, if you think about the gods of Ephesus, the Artemises that we, we talked about, these uh, mythological gods that the Greeks had created, they are very fickle. Some days they're in a good mood and they like people and they do good things for people. The next day they're in a bad mood and lightning comes down from the heavens. And so there is no intentionality. It's just moody gods messing with people. And, and if you read through Greek mythology, really that's a lot of it. Is it's just like whatever feeling they happen to have in the moment. In Ephesians 1, what we're seeing is the exact opposite. We see a plan. We see that plan being put into play. 
We see promises being guaranteed that that plan will be successful and God will follow through on the pieces that are yet to come, namely the judgment day and our forgiveness and all those sorts of things uh, on that, that last day. Uh, and it being something that is well thought out and intentional. Um, so as we go through and look at it, that's the idea that is the overriding context we want to convey. Uh, the intentionality of God on our behalf. And intent matters. I mean, it matters uh, to us, right? If somebody does something with, you can think of, think of how much intention matters to you. If somebody does the wrong thing, like your kid comes through the house and they put mud all over the floor and you see, you come in the house and you see mud all over the floor and you get to the end of the mud trail of footprints and there's a kid holding some dandelions for you and say, mommy, I picked these for you. They did the wrong thing, but their intention makes a big difference to you, doesn't it? Oh, no whoopings. You know, I mean, it, it, you, you factor that in. If we would do that when somebody makes the wrong decision, the intention behind it, still matters, how much more so when God does all of these good things for us, to know that behind those good things is intent. It was a purposeful planned thing. So, God's blessed, it says in, in verse 3. Um, the word uh, blessing also, at, at its basic core, just means to speak well of. So when we think of the idea of um, offering a blessing to God, we can't really give him anything that he doesn't already have, right? So the way that God blesses us is not the way we can bless him, but we can speak well of him. We can say and, and, and offer him praises. So in Ephesians 1, uh, blessed be the God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and that in Jesus is every spiritual blessing. So by definition, if every spiritual blessing is in Jesus... Outside of Jesus is none, right? So this matches what we read in other places in the Bible. Probably one of the clearest on this is John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, that exclusive nature of it. Um, and, uh, and then in verse 4, it will say, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. And we talked about this a little bit, touched on this last week, but I, I think it's important enough of a language throughout the Bible that we should spend a little bit of time on it, because here it talks about God choosing us. And even the name church means the called out. God's the one doing the calling. So God chooses, God calls uh, in the book of John, it talks about God draws. So one way you could walk away with that language is if God's doing the choosing, God's doing the calling, God's doing the drawing, then it's all God and he just simply chooses who he chooses. And if I get chosen, great, I go to heaven. If I don't get chosen, then I go to hell. That is a, a belief system that is out there. It is a common um, uh, root to a lot of religious confusion in the world today. Uh, if you've ever heard the term being born in sin or total depravity, then you have heard of this teaching because that very idea that if I'm born in sin, what can I do about something I'm born in? It just is what it is, right? Yeah, Mike? Mm-hmm. 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 Well, and I think you get you're getting to the point of it too, which is God has chosen what he's gonna search for, right? So God does some choosing, he sets some criteria of what he's gonna do. I want to save what kind of people? 
I want to save people who have faith in my son, who have honest hearts, who are good soil. Um, the lost sheep that doesn't want to be lost, right? You know, there's a difference between the sheep that says, I'm out of here, see you later, and the sheep that got wandering and then realized, I'm out here in the wilderness and I could use some help. So there is that element to it that God chooses, but he's choosing who he's searching for, and he's searching to find that amongst all mankind. And you have a say-so in what kind of sheep you're going to be and what kind of soil you're going to be. And so, the, both languages show up in the Bible. Um, you see some language in the Bible, for example, and, and to go back to what Mike brought up with the prodigal son, in the story of the prodigal son, this wayward son, he wanders off, he leaves, and there's a decent portion of that story that focuses on the son making a choice. The son saying, I'm going to come to my senses and do something about that to go back to my father. So that's part of the story. But after the son makes that choice, what's the second part of the story? Who's the focus of the second part? It's the father and yeah, and then the brother as well. And the father, we see, makes a choice too. As soon as the son shows any desire to come back, the father runs out to greet him. He says, put a robe on him and put a ring on him and, 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 and let's uh, kill the fattened calf and let's feast. This is a wonderful day. So there is a, a meaning of the two that happens. And what you're seeing in Ephesians 1 is a focus primarily not on the, the wayward son's decision, but on the father being prepared to re-establish a relationship and redeem the wayward son if he changes his mind. What? Right. That's a great point. The father is the first one to see the opportunity for reconciliation and does something about it. And that's what we're reading in Ephesians, right? Is here's God's plan. And even if you and I don't get that that's his plan, even if we haven't decided yet we want that reconciliation, you know, there are people out there living their life right now who are not at all really concerned about their relationship with God and being right with him. If we're honest with ourselves, there may very well be people in this building who are living their lives right now who are not that concerned about reconciliation with their father. Yes, Mike, that would be the second son. Yes, that's right. Lost in the backyard. Yeah. <laughs> Lost in the backyard, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Waste of time. Yeah. Yo, yo, you're absolutely right. And I like how you put that. He sees the end game, right? He sees what we're not seeing. He sees it from a heavenly perspective. He sees it with deep, permanent, constant love. Our love for people is a little bit more fickle. Little is an understatement. A lot more fickle. Um, and so when people make bad choices, we're much quicker to be like Pilate and wash our hands of it and just say, ah, I'm done. But God doesn't do that. We see that intentional planning on his part on our behalf. So what, what we need to understand, and there's, there's two bits to it. There's the doctrinal bit where we, we need to make sure we don't get caught up in false teaching that exists, which is the Bible's not teaching specific predestination, where God says, I choose that one and I don't choose that one. 
this one automatically goes to heaven and this one automatically goes to hell. That's nowhere in your Bible whatsoever. But he is teaching general predestination. That is, God has an eye as he searches and hopes and desires that all men might be saved, but is unwilling to change the criteria just to whitewash sin. There is a path to have sin removed, but it is a just path. And the only way for, that, for sin to be removed in a just way is through his son. And so that's the system. He's created a system for salvation. He planned it. He purposed it. He was thoughtful about it. But those, that salvation exists within his son and nowhere else. Um, so it's... It, Ephesians, what it does is show us that God has been caring all along. And the fact that we wake up one day and realize it doesn't mean it began when we realized it. It was occurring the entire time. Um, uh, so that language that you run into of being predestined uh, according to the purpose of his will, that's what we're talking about there is God seeing the horizon, and that's really where predestination, that's the Greek, is, it's, the, it's the word we get horizon from. God's seeing all the way out to the edge, the end game, right? He's seeing all and saying, here's the boundary, here's what I will set, and then waiting with great patience for all the, that would come. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the, if God's just looking for, he's got a specific set that he's already written down, and you have no involvement in that process, why is he waiting? What's the waiting? It doesn't make any sense. He's not. None of, so none of that matches, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, any questions or further comments before we move forward a little bit there? Um, problem I can run into with this is we could easily spend like, I don't know, five classes in here and, and just touch the hem of the garment. Um, uh, here are just several uh, different passages along those lines um, uh, with the, the concept of general predestination, uh, along with the Second Peter 3 one, uh, Matthew 18, it's not the will of my Father who is heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God doesn't wish that any should perish. Ezekiel 18, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked? You know, is it, if specific predestination is true, then God is really good with certain people going to hell because he's chosen these ones go to heaven and these ones go to hell. But Ezekiel says, no, he doesn't have any pleasure in that. That doesn't bring him any joy or comfort or anything like that. That's not what he's looking for. Okay, and so here is this plan that is laid out that in Christ all man might be saved and it says uh, uh, that we would be predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. And so on your hand out there, I have the question, in what way does God's will lead to the praise of his glorious grace? Because that's what part of the plan is that God's way and his will would lead to people praising his glorious grace. So part of the plan is that God would be praised. How does that work? Yeah, so when we follow him, the plan works. We become recipients of his grace. And ultimately, when we are recipients of that grace, what do we end up doing? Praising him. So you see how those pieces work together. What God is looking for, part of his plan, and, and, and we forget God can have something in it for him, right? It's, it's not selfish to desire something for yourself as long as it's not hurting other people in order to do so, right? Like if I, if I covet something, the problem with coveting something is that you got it and I want it. And so I have to take it from you in order to get it. Well, that's not good. But when 
you desire something that will bless you while also blessing others, that's exactly what God intends. And that's what God does. He blesses us. He gives us great grace. We get a new lease on life and the hope of heaven. And someday we walk through heaven's gates with great joy in our heart. And every tear wiped away where we fight death and sickness no more. All of that's gone. And he gets praise for that. And rightfully so. So one of the things that we should see in, in God's plan. And, um, and, and I think this is where the rubber meets the road. Is to ask ourselves. If I am following and working God's plan. I should be a more praise filled person in my life today than I was five years ago. And it's hard to measure day to day. But if we measure in larger chunks of time, is my relationship with God, because I'm following his plan and I'm following his will, am I becoming somebody who is more full of joy when I sing praises to him, when I pray, uh, when I have opportunities to worship? Am I finding myself becoming somebody who is more engaged in that process of praising his glorious grace than I was five years ago? Because that is the plan. And I mean, I would like to think that when I get to the age where I am near death, which for all I know, that's right now. I mean, that's the other bit of it, right? You don't know when you go home. But imagining I live a full life and I get near the end, I would like to think that I am more engaged in the worship process then than I am right now. And that, that seems a fair hope. And that's part of the plan. Um, any thoughts? Yeah. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and and even the whole statement of save makes a statement of lost in the first place. If, I, if he made a choice from the very beginning that this specific person is saved, I'm not sure that even counts as being saved in the first place, right? And, and Gwen's over there, I, touching her heart, saying it's heartfelt, right? It's heartfelt worship. That's the free will bit, right? Praise the glory of his grace doesn't happen if we're a bunch of robots. There has to be a choice in the process on our part. But what we see about the plan is how much does he desire you to make that choice? It's an interesting to think about how much does God crave your love? So you don't normally think of it that way. We normally think about how we crave his love. And that's true too. But how much does he crave your love? Not how much does he need it. That's a different thing, right? He doesn't need your love. But how much does he crave it? To the point of sending his son to die. That's how much he craves it. And so he, he wants that relationship. He wants that praise to his glorious grace. And he wants it to be voluntary and heartfelt um, uh, and intentional on our part, right? He's intentional. We're supposed to be intentional. Um, okay. Uh, With which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood. Uh, two pieces to this as we consider this. One, we can never forget the term that that God uses for Jesus here is that we will be blessed in the beloved. That phrase there is stating God's love for Jesus. Jesus is the beloved. He is the unblemished lamb. He is the perfect embodiment of God. He is uh, all of these things that we think about uh, with the character of Jesus and how much we adore his character and who he is the Father more so, 
right? Because our love of righteousness is not as deep as his love of righteousness. And the reason I know that is, we sometimes choose to do the wrong thing, which means you don't love righteousness that much, right? <laughs> there are some days you, you're like, I, I, I generally like it, but in this circumstance, I would rather do the wrong thing. So we have more of a, unfortunately, a, a fickle love towards righteousness, but God is not that way. So when he sees Jesus, who is the embodiment of righteousness, he loves that. So he's the only begotten son of the Father. He's the beloved. And then we're redeemed through his blood. So the one being that ever walked this planet, the God the Father looked down and said, I just love everything about him. Because God can't say that about you. He can say he loves you, but he can't say he loves everything about what's going on in your life. Right? But with Jesus, he can look down and say, I love everything about what's going on in his life. Everything he's doing, I love it. It's exactly what I would do. And then the cost to redeem us was him dying. Um, try and think of somebody that you love very deeply. That could be a child. That could be your spouse. It could be a parent. It could be a friend like a David Jonathan where you're knit closer than a brother. And then imagine voluntarily offering them to die for an enemy. I don't know if I can process that. And yet that's exactly what that says. He's the beloved. And yet we're redeemed through his blood. Uh, somebody want to try and give me a working definition of redemption. Define redemption. When we talk about we're redeemed through his blood. What does that even mean? Okay. Did you look that up before class? Did you Google it? Yeah, me. Yeah, it is the bill. It's a good definition, but it was just so precise. I was just really impressed. Like, I want to know, is that like how your brain works or does your brain work like... Uh, looking up the Strong's Concords, but yes. Uh, <laughs> either one you get credit for. But yeah, say it again. Liberation procured through payment. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's the process of buying something back, liberating something. It's the, it's the cost to take something and, and make it something again of worth or value. So, because typically involved in the redemption process is something wasn't, had somehow ceased to be a value, and we want to redeem its value. We want to put it back in a position where it's valuable again. Um, that's why we talk about things like that was so-and-so's redemption story. What we mean by that is they did something that they maybe had gone through a wilderness section in their life, and then they got to a point where they made some choices and, and redeemed themselves. You know, man, that guy made a ton of mistakes, but in this moment, he redeemed himself. The idea here is your value was liberated you were put back in a position of value and worth at the cost of something. And that trade that was made was the death of the son, the death of the beloved. And um, that tells you your worth in the eyes of God. Because Ephesians really isn't about you. It's about what you get. But it's about you understanding the mind of God in thinking about these things. How does God think about Jesus? How does God think about the church? How does God think about the plan? All of those things are, are what Ephesians is answering. And your redemptive worth to God was his son's death. That was 
that was something they felt was a worthwhile redemptive price. Now we know, are we worth that? No. There's n- if, you, if you line me up next to Jesus and you say, who's worth more? That's a very easy question, right? But the value in the mind of God of lost sinners was that. And so what we're trying to do is wrap our brain around how deep is that love? How, how much does he care? Um, and then verse 8, uh, it says, uh, Forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, right? So he redeemed us because he's gracious through the blood of his son, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. Uh, I want to focus a little bit on that word lavish, um, if, if somebody said that was a lavish dinner, what would they mean by lavish? What, what is that? Let's define terms for a second. Yes. Very special. Okay. So a lavish thing is something very special. Anything else you add to that? Yeah. What? I- elaborate. Yes. Elaborate. Okay, so you have, it's very special, it's elaborate, so there's a complexity and detail oriented to it. It's exceeding what's necessary. It's probably not bread and water, the basics to just feed you, right? It's, it's exceeding what is necessary, or in some cases, even appropriate. When we talk about the love that God shows us, which we're we're told is in his wisdom and insight, and it's part of his plan, which he waited for the fullness of time in order to enact. So God was intentional about it, like he's going to bring it about in a very specific time, specific way. And and to your point, with that elaborate nature of it, right, is it was an elaborate plan to bring Jesus. A lot of different details have to fall into place. I mean, as you read through the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament is describing the complexity of that plan. And how God put that all together. And it's so that you had more than just what was necessary. If you were to, to say, what, what do you need? Your soul needs to not end up in hell. Right? That, I, 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 could, I could say that that I feel like is, my soul needs to not die the second death. But do I need to be an adopted son of God? Is that a title that I needed to have? I mean, the angels are in heaven, right? And that terminology is not used for them, that they are sons of God. That adoption phrase, that's lavish. So there's a level of God's grace that goes beyond what is necessary for us. And that was his plan all along. It's not him just saying, let me fill your cup. It's let, let your cup overflow. So <clears throat> um, th- this language of the, uh, of the Bible really is pointing towards a God who is not just giving you the bare minimum. He's giving you above and beyond what you need to receive. I think about... Um, Peter and asking, he said, we've sacrificed so much, what will we gain? And he, and he says, you sacrifice these things. And Jesus says, um, you will gain a hundredfold and more in the, in the age to come. In other words, you gain in this life when you serve me, but you will also gain in the next. He didn't have to do that. Does God have to bless you here if he gives you eternity? You don't need that. Right? We could all live Job lives. But he gives us so much. Um, okay. Uh, then last bit here as we uh, are getting closer to the end of time and, um, and looking at the major pieces of this section. Uh, you get down to the bottom And we begin to talk about the Holy Spirit's part in it. So we've talked about the Father and that intentionality and that planning to bless us. We've talked about the Son and how he's the redemptive price. 
And uh, it, it's been his desire and the father's desire to pay that price. But now here, he says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So one of the things I want you to see, so this is, a, this is something that we struggle with, is like, how does the Holy Spirit seal us? One uh, interpretation is the Holy Spirit seals us because the Holy Spirit physically comes into us and then begins to control us and give us feelings of being saved. You see that if you want to go way back in the history of religious confusion, um, there used to be a thing called the sinner's pew, and it was the front row pew. And it was for the people who were not sure yet whether they were saved, and they'd sit in the sinner's pew. So next time you sit in the front row, you just think about that. Right? And the sinner's pew, you would sit there, and you were waiting for your religious experience. When the Holy Spirit came upon you and you knew, you knew and had had that religious experience and feeling that you were saved. That is one view of what's being talked about here is that the Holy Spirit seals us in that he comes in and gives us this emotional experience. The problem that I have with that is, one, that's not what you see in the pattern of the New Testament. We don't see people being saved through a religious experience as we read through the New Testament. So if that is the method, it's odd that nobody in the first century had that process for salvation. The other is that we read in the New Testament how oftentimes we have to be encouraged because we don't feel saved. Have you ever felt that way where it's like you read the Bible and the Bible tells you you're saved and you're, if you read the things that the text says, you are living as God intended but you do not feel like you're going to heaven. You don't feel worthy. You don't feel like it's... I mean, if you've ever had that kind of experience where you have that angst over it, well, if the sealing of the Holy Spirit gives you that confidence, then every time you emotionally don't feel right with God, you have, a, you have any worry or doubt, then has the Holy Spirit left you? Do, you? do you see the problem there? We now have this kind of... If my religious experience makes me feel in, then can my religious experience make me feel out? But instead, what we see in the text here, I think, is, is a little bit more straightforward. We're sealed through the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. You, you notice how in the context here, these are tied to, together. If you look in the Bible, over and over again, the writers of the Bible say... What I have written down, we wrote down because the Holy Spirit guided us. The Holy Spirit guided us to say these words and to write them down. Peter says that in, uh, uh, in his letters if, and later on here in Ephesians, Paul will say that, that he's been given insight into the mystery of Christ. So when you read what I say, you can know the mystery. What he's saying here is the reason that you and I... And the reason the people of the first century could know that there was a path to salvation and God loved them was because the Holy Spirit was the one who gave the promise. You're sealed because the Holy Spirit is God and he's told you, if you follow Christ, you'll be saved. Now here, if a, if a human being makes you a promise, your level of confidence in that promise is based entirely upon the character of the person who gave you the promise, right? So if you trust the person a lot and they promise to do something and they've shown a habit of do, following through, then you probably have a high degree of confidence that they're going to do it. But what if they're a ne'er-do-well, you know? Or somebody you don't know at all, some stranger on, uh, that you've met one time and they make you a promise. Your confidence is much lower. Who do we have who is actually the one who gave us the promises of redemption in Christ, who spoke the words and made sure that we had it? Not the apostles, not the prophets, because they were just mouthpieces for the Holy Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit who's guaranteed your inheritance. 
And how do you know that the apostles and prophets were speaking not just their own ideas, but God's ideas? So Paul comes into a city, and they've never met Paul before. So he is a stranger and maybe a ne'er-do-well. And I'm just saying that word because I like to say ne'er-do-well. Just so you know, that's a fun word. Um, he comes into a city. Nobody knows him. He begins to preach this message of salvation in Jesus. Why should they listen to Paul? Paul comes to Ephesus or any other city and he begins to preach the gospel of Jesus. Why should they listen to him versus some guy talking about Zeus? What could Paul do and set him apart? Miracles. It's the miracles. And where did they get the miracles from? They're sometimes referred to as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit seals the deal. Because he's the one who guided the words. What we have here is not the words of men. It's the words of God, words of the Holy Spirit. And we have those words, and we, they were sealed by the miraculous abilities that were given to those who spoke them, that gave proof that they were sent from God, not men. So here, you have three things. You have God planning and purposing, the Father planning and purposing, the Son following through and actually doing the thing that would save you. And then the message of salvation, it didn't come to you from men. It came from God himself, the Holy Spirit. So all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the, the, the past is the Father doing the planning, the, the action done by the Son, and then the promise given by the Holy Spirit. That makes sense? Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so we are uh, right at about time. Um, next week, um, your reading will be Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 22. So we'll finish out the chapter uh, next week. But this initial sentence uh, is, is all about us understanding how deeply God loves mankind and all the work that happened in order to make it happen. Uh, thank you so much. We'll close down there and, uh, and pick up in Ephesians 1, 15 next week.